Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night. Yeah, that was, <laughs> that was terrific. There's no possible way that I could justify that, and I'm going to make you regret oh. that. Good afternoon, Okies. <laughs> Thank you. It is, um, I don't see, I just want to say, if I may, Please. Before, it's so wonderful to be here uh, in Oklahoma. I, I meant to say, by the way, good Pesach and, and happy Easter. Um, <laughs> to, uh, to be here not just uh, in the buckle of the, the Bible Belt, but in the prong of the buckle. <laughs> um, I appear before you totally unqualified to um, address the, the, the subject at hand. Um, I am not a public speaker, I'm not an academic, I'm not a stand-up comedian. My God, by the way, those comedians last night, were they not? <laughs> Incredible. Absolutely incredible. I had one joke. I did have one joke about all of us on the road to hell. And uh, I don't know if you know this, but 48 hours ago, the Pope cancelled hell. <laughs> this is absolutely astounding. After a thousand years, as basically Article 1 in the Catechism, it's over. There is no, there is no hell. Um, <laughs> which is, I suppose is great. Uh, I mean, we could wrap this up early. Uh, <laughs> it's absolutely, absolutely amazing. I must say, if I were a Catholic, I would be f***ing furious. <laughs> I've been paying into this scheme for decades. <laughs> absolutely unbelievable. Um, but anyway, thank you so much. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I feel very honored to be here. I, am, I stand before you a proud Atheist. Um, thank you. Well, I should say, <clears throat> I should say, however, that that it's a straight. I come from a godless country. Um, all I, 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 well, yeah, yes, yeah, correct. <laughs> I don't, I don't mean, I don't, mean, I don't say that in any sort of triumphalist way. But um, a, the latest Pew report suggests that 70% of Britons under the age of 30 do, uh, are atheists. Um, so much so that, in fact, well, they actually don't use the word atheist because it's not even a word over there, really. It's just, it's this, in fact, and we don't really have events like this. Um, this would be like me addressing a, a conference of right-handed people. <laughs> you know, there's just no... There's no sort of glue to keep the whole thing together. What would I say? Uh, scissors. <laughs> uh, aren't they just perfectly designed for us? <laughs> it's just, it just doesn't really work. But I realize that this is, um, this is a very, very different country. And it, it not, not just because of its founding principles, but... Uh, I happen to believe, we, we don't yet know if there is a, a gene for religion. Um, uh, that's, a, that's a difficult thing to determine. If there is one, you have got to get breeding. Um, <laughs> because religious people have an awful lot of children. Um, <laughs> but, but even if there isn't specifically one for religion, I do think there is a great separation between our two countries in, in, uh, as it relates to religion because in one way or another you are all descended from people who got on the boat. You took, you took a, a risk, you, you submitted yourself to an ordeal to get to some, to get to the other side. It is quite metaphorical this, I realize. <laughs> but I am descended from people who did not get on the boat. Uh, <laughs> We possibly went down to look at the boat. <laughs> and we said, mm, yeah, I'm all right. <laughs> and I think that is a very, a, it's a very, very big difference in the psyches of the two, of our two nations. And uh, I'm, I'm very uh, conscious of that when I come here and I, I travel around this great country and I see that God has branches everywhere. Um, 
and uh, it, it makes it, it's probably the single thing that makes me feel the most foreign, um, it, it, uh, the most alien. Is this one subject which I'm, I'm now wittering on too much, and I can feel you sort please. of tugging at my trousers. Not even, yeah. not no, even um, a little. So anyway, once again, not thank even you a so little, much. please. Oh. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Hugh, let me, let me assure you, we are so thankful that you're here. We're so thankful that you're here. By the way, donating his time, ladies and gentlemen, to come here and talk with us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so gladly we're, we're, so, gladly we're, so. we're so glad you're here, uh, and we're, we're really, really um, thrilled to have you. Um, the, the big question, though, is why are you here? Um, why? <laughs> we are so grateful to have you on our stage. Why have you decided to come here? Why have you decided to come to our stage tonight? Right at this exact moment, I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> But that's always true at the beginning of anything. I, I found, and you would say, probably any actor would say the same. Those sort of 10 minutes before you go on, you, you, know, you present yourself to any gathering, that's when actors are going, why the fuck am I doing this? <laughs> I'm, I'm still coming down off that high. Um, well, I, I, um, I've been an atheist. I, l I really have been an atheist as long as I can remember. I, that's not saying much. I have a very poor memory. But <laughs> I, I, this sounds facetious, but it's actually true that, that God and Santa Claus sort of left together uh, in, from my life. Yeah. They really did. And I mean, I, I'm not claiming that, that I, you know, had this sort of rational clarity that allowed me to pull myself up out of some superstitious mire. I don't mean that. I, I, my parents were sort of vaguely observant. We went to church. They probably would have gone to church at Easter weekend, for example. Mm -hmm. Maybe twice a year they'd gone. I don't think they believed. I think they wanted me to understand the form, uh, the way you would like your child to you, you know, learn bridge or country dancing or something. You just think you don't... <laughs> You don't have to like it, you just have to know roughly how, you know, don't chew gum, don't smoke cigars in, in, in synagogue, and, or, you know, whatever it might be. Um, but, but I, so I grew up really in a, in a, in a agnostic, it was the word they probably would have used, although I don't really approve of it as a word. It's a, I, I don't really know what it, well, not, a, I don't disapprove of it, I just don't know what it means exactly. Um, You're agnostic about the meaning of the word agnostic. I am, thank you, thank you. So. <laughs> But I also, I do think that my father's profession, he was spent the second half of his career, he qualified very late in, in life, not until he was in his 40s. I don't mean he wasn't good. Uh, it didn't take him 20 years to qualify. I mean that he, was a, he became a doctor late in life. And I always grew up, because I admired him so much, I grew up with this sort of reverence for science and the empirical and the provable. Um, and I think that probably colored me almost more than anything else. Um, I used to be much more fiery. I used to pound tables and grab lapels uh, when I was younger uh, on the subject of religion. I don't do that so much anymore. Um, part, I, I love that. You love it? I, yes, I, I know you do. <laughs> I know you do. You're a fire breather. Yeah. Wow. I'm, I'm, um, well, I'm slightly medicated, so uh, it's all. <laughs> we have plenty of medicine for you. Yeah, right. By the way, you have help. so used to um, fake martinis. <laughs> <laughs> actors, actors see a glass like that, and it's a glass of water with an olive in it. Yeah. Oh, blood! That's, <laughs> um, that, uh, that's, that's firing real bullets. Um, uh, no, I, I'm much, I am much less um, argumentative than I used to be, um, mu much less combative. Pa apart from anything else, I, it doesn't work. I, 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 can't, I don't think you can talk people out of it necessarily. Um, and in fact, I, I mean, I just examining myself, you can't talk me out of much. Right. I don't change my mind. I don't know how many, 
who here can remember the last time they changed their mind about something significant? Yeah. Oh, actually, that's quite impressive. That's a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that was sort of t 20 or 30. That's, that's much more than I thought, uh, and good for you. Uh, I don't mean like, like a brand of breakfast cereal. I mean <laughs> something, something substantial. Well, good for you. I don't do it, or I, I can't remember the last time I did it. Um, I, and I think that's a failing in me. I, uh, I'm not proud of that. Well, I mean, it, we all have those the, the preconceived notions. We all have our cognitive dissonance. We all have our, our stuck in the mudness. Um, what brings you to the American Atheist Convention itself? Why? Uh, what What about the movement brings you to take time out of your life and fly to Oklahoma and sit on stage with me? <laughs> Well, you are a very charismatic um, uh, draw, but let me say, first of all. Yeah. And I, I, I watched you do battle with Bill O'Reilly, and I, I went, oh. <laughs> um, No, I, I, I realized that the infringement of religion into public policy, it, Public policy is what matters, really. What people believe in their own minds is, is up to them, and is their right, and they should damn well defend that right to believe whatever they want. I believe all kinds of absurd things about myself. From the age of 14 to 17, I believed I was Dirty Harry. Uh, <laughs> and I would walk down the street completely being Dirty Harry. Um, I mean, it was a delusion, but it was uh, which I voluntarily entered into, and. I would have snapped out of it if someone said, the building's on fire. I would have, you know, I wouldn't have been Dirty Harry in that situation. <laughs> um, but, you know, people have the right to their own head. And, and uh, for how much longer, we don't know, but they, they do have that right. <laughs> where it enters public policy, where it infringes on other people. I'll give you an absolute, uh, this is a tiny example, but I just think it's so significant. What I boil with rage when I see an NFL player thanking God for his victory. I, I, it's, and it's not because, it's not because he's articulating his relationship with what he imagines to be that character who's intervened in his uh, affairs. It's not that. It's what it says about the opposing team. Yeah. That's where it... The, the, to actually stand there and brazenly declare that God is against your opponent, <laughs> it makes me want to vomit. <laughs> the, the arrogance of it and the sort of the dumbness, the, it, it, that's, that seems to be such a revealing moment where people are inflicting an attitude on an area of, well, that happens to be a case of just public manners. Mm -hmm. That just seems so ill-mannered. But it also is a, it's a sign of where, um, you know, religion gets its foot in the door and allows all kinds of things to be done in its name on the presumption that everybody shares that, whatever the belief may be. And you've got, and you've got athletes who have spent years, nay, decades practicing every day. These are the most skilled athletes in the world. Yeah. Uh, and they, on an individual level, can't take credit for their achievements. Right. They, on an individual level, think that not only are they failures without a man in the sky, but that the man in the sky has blessed them particularly yeah, yeah. with this. You know, um, that, the, the, that the, I mean, yes, Tom Brady is pretty close to God, but, <laughs> <laughs> but he's not really. Wow. 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 But I, but I always find it, I always find it sad when they do that on, on multiple levels, uh, one of which is that they're using their fame to push their religion on other people's children, which makes me really angry. But also, they have been pushed on it. They're victims of indoctrination too. Their pastor has told them that they couldn't do it themselves. Right. Even though they've done it themselves. Right. Uh, as stealing the credit and giving it to religion, AKA the pastor themselves. Yes, that's right. It, but but the, there's a weird paradox, isn't there? Because it seems to be a strange combination of incredible humility 
to, to submit to the words of the pastor or the idea of the God yeah. and surrender the credit for your own uh, excellence or your victory. But also, it's co the humility is combined with this monumental arrogance to think that, that God, if, you know. He likes oh, you best. Oh, I've got it, yeah. The, the it. creator of a trillion, trillion stars likes I've you best. Calm down. Yeah. Got to calm down. No, don't calm down. This, I'm, I'm just getting started. Okay. <laughs> So uh, we have a few clips to play from some of your most famous appearances. Uh, Do I have to sit here for that? Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> okay. you've, you've probably seen most of these before. Um, but uh, <laughs> Well, actually, you'd be surprised. I have, there's whole chunks of it I've never seen. I'm not, a, I'm not a good. You don't watch yourself. Not a good watcher, no. Well. And, also, and, and actually, even less good as a listener, I would find I could just about survive accidentally seeing footage being played somewhere, and I would go, oh. I could sort of, but when I heard myself, I, I would actually have to run out into the parking lot. And, and, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, well, but I'm prepared to do it right now, if that's, all right. if that's what it takes. Let's yeah, let's, let's see what all the fuss was about. Let's see. <laughs> Okay, l let's play clip one and, st and start this thing going from okay. the house. God talks to him. It's not psychosis, he's just religious. The only medical issue that showed up on the blood work is low sodium. No, you talk to God, you're religious. God talks to you, you're psychotic. A lot of people experience their religion as something more than symbolic. That doesn't mean- God ever talked to you when you were in the seminary? No. God's loss, our gain. He's either psychotic or a scam artist. He was actually uh, really impressive. Well, yeah, with the burning bush and all. It's quite the show. He was intelligent, polite, dignified. He's not a typical 15-year-old. And he told Cameron, God wants her to stop being pissed at me over the article. God knows you stole Cameron's article. He knows she's harboring vengeful thoughts. I'm over it. Yeah, I can tell that from the Berlin Wall, the body language between you. I'm shocked that he picked up on it. Low sodium. Check for Addison's. No pigmentation and potassium levels are normal. Cirrhosis? Liver feels fine. Transaminases are normal. We should monitor his saline intake to correct the low sodium. No more than one MEQ per liter per hour. Let's push the patient history, see if there's any evidence of drugs or other delusions. I'll take care of it. All right. So, so there's a, I, I really like that clip because there's so much meat in such a small clip. Um, so House himself, the character, was very atheistic, very, very anti-religion. Uh, the first question that is on the minds of a lot of people is how much of Hugh is in House? Uh, <laughs> you mean by weight? Or <laughs> uh, well, I mean... How, how I would say much more of the, of the creator, David Shaw. I mean, I really, I just happen to be an atheist playing an atheist character. Mm -hmm. the, 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 really, the person you should have invited is the guy who created the show. Um, <laughs> I don't or think or we, I, I should have got him to write me a speech. Uh, he, should, he, he should be writing my um, answers. But if I had done that, we wouldn't have sold 850 Stop. tickets. Stop. <laughs> By the way, 850. <laughs> Um, I, I suppose it would have been, uh, it would have been hard to, if I'd been a, could I have played house if I was a, if I were a Jehovah's Witness? Hmm. Um, or could I, now being an atheist, play a Jehovah's Witness? I don't know the answer to that. Um, I think it would be difficult. I don't mean because of the dishonesty, because all acting is dishonest, obviously. Mm -hmm. it's, it's consensual dishonesty. Um, I don't know. I think it would have been difficult. I have been in situations where I've, I've turned things down because of a, um, a religious component that I, that I didn't think I could. So tell me about that. Well, I, I once got into a heated, this is not really a religion, uh, um, I got into a heated discussion with a director about playing Arthur Conan Doyle, um, who, surprisingly, given that he created the most uh, sort of 
ruthlessly rational character in, in all fiction, he himself was a committed spiritualist and a believer in psychic phenomena. And uh, there was a scene or an, uh, part of the story was related to his, Conan Doyle's belief in, in what were called the Cottingley fairies. I don't know if you've ever heard this story. Well, you, I mean, look at you. <laughs> My God, that's so impressive. Well, um, I said I just didn't know how to sort of inhabit that. I just wouldn't, I wouldn't know the, I wouldn't understand the landscape that could produce that set of thoughts. Hmm. And he said, well, come now, if you were going to play a murderer, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have to kill someone to play a murderer. Right. And I said, yes, actually, I would. Um, <laughs> I take my research very seriously. <laughs> um, no, I said, I said that I, I, that's true, but I think that differs insofar as I can understand what I take to be the components of murder, which are whatever they might be, rage or jealousy or greed or whatever, they, um, whatever causes one person to hit another person with a frying pan, which is what most murders are. You know, it's just that sudden rageful um, uh, loss of control. And those, those are things that I could understand. Um, but, but actually, the, the belief in, in the fairies, I don't know. That, that would be, that was a tough one. It's a tough one. And, and funnily enough, you will be amazed. I don't want to spoil the ending for you. But at the end of her life, so this picture was taken in the First World War. At the end of her life, mid-80s, this woman died. And, and just, uh, almost on her deathbed, she confessed, it was faked. <laughs> they weren't real fairies. Amazing. <laughs> Good grief, Holmes, you moron. <laughs> yes, amazing, amazing. Um, and there have been, been some other examples of that uh, where I, I just think, uh, I don't know how to do it. I also am not completely sure that I want to contribute to the, this, um, all this fol de that, that surrounds it. I don't, just don't see it in the same way. There's a huge um, documentary going on at the moment uh, on CNN about the Pope, um, uh, which I have not watched, nor will I. Um, I mean, not, not a great point of principle. It just doesn't interest me. But the, it's hard to avoid the trailers. The trailers for it drive me mad. I just think I don't, I just don't, have, any, I don't have any part of that. So you would nonsense. turn down a part based on the ethics of playing a religious person or a spiritualist. That, 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 well, that, yes, that, for those that two reasons. One is, that, uh, one is that I, I, I'm, I would not feel equipped to do it because I wouldn't understand the, the process that got that person, in, that character into that situation. And also, there are certain kinds of story where you think, uh, I'm not sure this is a healthy uh, message I, I, in as far as stories have messages. Um, you know. Well, thank so, you yes, for I, making that choice. You're welcome. Thank you for making that choice. So um, I knew Douglas Adams for a few years before he died. And brilliant, 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 brilliant guy, man. great yeah. guy. Uh, and in the spirit, <clears throat> in the period of time that I knew him, he moved from the UK to Los Angeles. And when he was in the UK, when he was living in the UK, I asked him if he had had any um, negative repercussions to his atheism affect his career. And he didn't quite know how to answer it. When I first, this is when I first met him, he didn't quite know how to answer that question. And then. We stayed in touch and uh, we became friendly and he moved to Los Angeles. And then he called me one day after living in Los Angeles for a brief period of time. And he said, now I know why you asked me that question. <laughs> so tell me about your experience as, uh, and if there's been any difference. You've played um, UK characters, you've been in the UK, you've been in America, uh, you're a TV icon here in America. Uh, you're a known atheist, and your character was an atheist. So tell me about the negative feedback or the negative repercussions, or has there been any negative repercussions to your career, and is there a difference between the two locations? There is a massive difference. Tell me about that. Well, uh, for example, I, I don't know if, if people are aware of this, but, but Tony Blair, for example, is a, is a pretty committed Catholic. 
that was something he more or less had to keep secret. Not secret, but it was something he kept quiet. It was considered an electoral liability in the UK. If people felt, um, you know, he's, he's uh, the, the phrase we use over there is God botherer. Um, <laughs> we would actually assume that he's actually not quite right in the head. Um, <laughs> The, the absolute reverse is true here. I cannot, I mean, you have, you have had a black president. You came within a uh, hair's breadth of having a woman president. I can, you know, but an atheist president is a long way off, I think. Yeah, you've, you've or got current. To, yeah. Oh, well. Yeah. Yeah. That's the question, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's, um, he's trying, he's just faking it. Yeah. Well, I mean. I mean Some might think. Um, but there were, there were 15 Republican candidates vying for that slot, and they were, they were competing with each other to be, uh, uh, you know, in piety, and it, it was absolutely nauseating to behold. But, um, <laughs> and, but I cannot believe, I cannot believe that it was in all those 50, what, I think the f sort of semi-final round, there were 15 of them. <laughs> <laughs> I just can't believe all 15 were... Um, it, it, just, it, it just can't be true. Although, although I do have a disagreement with you in this regard, hmm. that I'm not, you said, I'm, I read his book, by the way, it's awfully good. Oh, thank um, you. Uh, you, you are, you're, you're quite sort of, uh, you're firm, I'm gonna say that, <laughs> and in declaring that you either believe or you don't. I'm not sure that's true, I think, I think I don't mean there's a middle ground of people going who sort of believe. No, it's more complicated than that. I think people do and they don't mm -hmm. at the same time. Because I think human beings are really strange about stories. We have a, um, an ability to, it seems to be what we do. It, storytelling is, after all, something we've been doing longer than almost anything else. I mean, Aeschylus was, was putting on, probably on a stage much like this. Um, <laughs> was putting on shows before the Greeks had worked out how to press an olive, mm -hmm. more or less. Mm -hmm. It's something, stories do provide people with um, a framework of, of, of sorts, and people are able to believe in them and not believe in them at the same time. That's, after all, how I make my living. Mm -hmm. um, we can go to a, a movie theater and we can sit there and we can gasp and cry and laugh and genuinely believe that this beloved character is going to die or that this, the couple won't be united, whatever it might be, at no point do we feel that we are actually in it, and yet we are. And we are able to, to control these. I think it's a really peculiar characteristic of human beings that we are able, not only able to see um, stories in things, but we can't not. We are constantly juggling with stories. I suppose it comes from a kind of pattern recognition some You're skill. talking about willful self-delusion. Yeah. I mean, we, I can lie in, a, in, a, in the bath and look at a patch of mold on the ceiling and say, that looks a bit like Wolf Blitzer. <laughs> uh, and that just seems to be a thing that, I don't mean to say, I don't mean Wolf Blitzer looks like a patch of mold. <laughs> Although, um, <laughs> It just seems to be a thing that we can do. We, c we can, we impose a, uh, we are looking for similarities and metaphors and allegories and synecdoches or whatever, that whole batch of things, constantly. It seems to be something we can't switch off. Um, and I think people, and, and we can do them simultaneously while knowing, like I could be Dirty Harry while buying a, a pack of gum. You know, I, it, the two things exist at the same time. So I think, when you say you either believe or you don't, I'm not, I'm not sure I go that far. I, I think a lot of people are doing both at the same time, so believing and not believing. And so we have these conversations, uh, for instance, the discrete epistemology, epistemological approach, the Socratic approach. I'm glad you tripped up on that. Yes. Um, <laughs> yes. Well, I if, got if, it the second time. Cleared, yeah, but if you'd cleared that one the first time, I'd have been really <laughs> Yeah, it, it would have been a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so so we, take the, we take people through these, these, these conversations and that's how we get them to admit to themselves because a lot of times they're, they're not believing but they are choosing to pretend to believe. Right. Because it's easier 
to choose to pretend to believe. That's what I was talking about uh, in Fighting God, which thank you so much for saying that. Um, and, and a lot of people confuse the idea of believing and choosing to pretend to believe. Yes. But you're suggesting that people believe and, belie believe and disbelieve at the same time. Is there yes. a difference? Um, yes, I think there is. Because conforming to something that other people do is, that's another human characteristic that, that, that seems to be um, very powerfully in our wiring, that we want to belong to the tribe and we will go along with what the tribe does. And we are also looking, when, when somebody, when a member of the tribe deviates and, for example, says that they don't believe in the thing that you believe in, it is a threat to the tribe. I think this is why people respond. And I, I mean, we all, atheists do this. Everybody does this. Human beings do this. If I, um, I flew yesterday, uh, man, a man in the, um, um, the airport lounge, um, probably in his 50s, took off his shoes and socks and put them on the table. And I thought... It's comfortable when you do that. It's not comfortable for me when you do that. Um, and I just thought... So I am immediately extrapolating all kinds of things from that one action. I, I'm feeling like he's a threat to the tribe. I'm thinking... <laughs> I cannot possibly... cannot possibly agree with this human being on any other subject. I, can, I just know that his choice of aftershave will make me sick. I know that his choice of music, the books he reads, the, the movies he likes, I'm going to disagree with that. Which is absurd, because it's possible that the only deviation he had from, from being a complete carbon copy of me as a tribe member was that one thing about the shoes. Mm -hmm. It's possible. But I take it as, we all do this, we right. take it as a sign of a million other things. And I think that's, um, that, that imposes a great pressure on people to conform and just do what everyone else is doing. Yeah. Um, and if we, if we all agree that we're going to believe in this thing, yeah, it's comfortable. And it's, uh, it's, it's civil in a way. Um, and that's not a completely destructive instinct, by the way, yeah. I don't think. So I might, well, maybe we disagree on that as well. I, could, I think that's an instinct that actually, for the most part, is benign and actually even vital. Um, and when, it, when that starts to disintegrate, which is what I see when the man puts his bare feet on the table, I just think, oh, it's all disintegrating now. <laughs> <laughs> if a man can do that, then there's no telling what could happen, you know. I know it's trivial. It's a very, very trivial thing. But that's what we do. I think we pick trivial things and we extrapolate and we infer and, and find patterns and, and resonances with other things because we, we can't switch it off. We're doing it all the time. And so speaking of can't switching it off and, and doing it all the time and trivial things, I want to talk a little bit about hate mail. I want to talk a little bit about hate. Right. Um, a lot of times uh, I get hate. You and I were talking last night about the hate that we get um, uh, at American Atheists and the death threats and all sorts of things like that. Um, have you experienced a difference in the hate? I, 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 what kind of reaction do you get from fans, positive and negative, that's atheism related uh, between the UK and I don't think any of it comes close to what you've experienced. <laughs> I, I have read some of yours and uh, I wrote a couple of them. <laughs> But uh, I've read some of yours, and it's truly astounding what, you, what you've had to endure. I was in a slightly unusual position. Well, first of all, I think I was protected. I was mollycoddled. I didn't realize it until halfway through the run of house that I was being protected. And then I started to exploit it horribly. Oh, Bring tell. me figs. <laughs> But uh, uh, until I realized that, I think what was happening was that it was sort of shielding me. So I saw, you know, I saw love more than hate. Mm, that's good. Um, I do remember, though, I think it was, that might have even been the first show we did. It was the first or second show. There was a scene. I won't say what the scene is because then some, a, a mischievous person could work out who the actress was. But there was a scene. Uh, the actress plainly disapproved of House's... Uh, sarcasm and his cynicism about God and 
his, um, his sort of rough style. She really, really was nettled by it. And uh, she um, started drawing. Um, while we, you know, they were setting up a shot and she'd be doing, drawing like this. At the end of the day, she said to me, this is how I, I think the scene should have ended. And she handed me this drawing, it was actually quite a good drawing, in fact, of her standing over me, stabbing me in the eye with the cane. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I, I was, uh, I was sort of rather flattered by it, I must say. I, <laughs> And I actually took it round to the, to the other, you know, the, to the crew, going, do you think, is that a death threat? I don't know. <laughs> Can I say that's my first death threat? Um, uh, I didn't frame it, though. Um, <laughs> no, I don't think I, the other thing, the other advantage that dramatically and in real life, I think that House had is, well, first of all, he's a doctor. So he's a healer. If House had been a brilliant, irascible, sarcastic, atheist uh, copywriter in an advertising agency, yeah. <laughs> I think people would have been a lot less, less sympathetic. The other thing is that he was in pain. So it, 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 I think we all of us have a sort of uh, sense of some kind of psychic e economy where if someone... We allow a certain latitude to people who are suffering for that latitude. And when you see a character who's in pain, but either he's, he's in physical pain, but also a kind of mental, psychological pain, it's hard to demand the same kinds of, we don't have the same kinds of expectations of, of that person. It's, it's sort of insulated the character from a degree of criticism that I, uh, you, able-bodied, handsome, dashing leader of American atheists, exactly. <laughs> Um, I really like you. You don't. <laughs> <laughs> you you don't have you don't have that insulation, um, so people will not give you the same latitude that they might have given House. I think they did. House was sort of very cleverly. I don't mean to say it was a cynical ploy. Uh, it was an important component of the character, but um, a, a byproduct of it was that it protected him. Um, I mean, he, even I felt. Uh, Yes, his start, he is abrasive and he's occasionally flat out mean, but by God, he's paying a price for it. He, this is a man who's so lonely and so tormented um, that I wouldn't, I wouldn't change places with him for anything. You know what I mean? Huh. Um, that which gave me a sympathy for for something, it, it allowed me to give him latitude, which I think the audience also did. I think that... So I think you might want to adopt that as a strategy. Ah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, that plays perfectly into our next clip. So let's, uh, let's, roll, clip, let's roll clip two and watch this. House, this is God. Look, I'm a little busy right now. I'm not supposed to talk during these things. Got time Thursday? Let me check. Oh, I got a plague. What about Friday? <laughs> Do I have to check with Cameron? Oh, damn it. She always wants to know why bad things happen. <laughs> like I'm gonna come up with a new answer this time. House. Okay. So so that so that plays perfectly. So, so House is in the MRI. He's getting, he's getting hurt. He's obviously injured, um, and he's, he's shitting on God right there. And he's talking about the big problem of God, the problem of evil. Um, is this, was this pain a deliberate tool then to protect him? Was it, was it, um, was it designed that way to, you know, to make I'm a actually, statement? Oh, I see. To see that I see. That he's brought it upon himself, you mean? Yeah. No, I don't think it was that. I don't think it was that. The the writer of House, David Shaw, who is, well, I'm not going to speak for him. He should come next year and talk to you. Absolutely brilliant, uh, brilliant man. Um, really astounding. Um, so I, I'm not going to try and um, encapsulate his views. Not my business. Um, I don't think that was in his mind. No, that that. In fact, that feels like a very 
unsureish sort of uh, conclusion to draw that that house we've got to we've got to see that it um, you know if only he'd open his heart to the to the risen Lord then okay. you know he'd be a much happier I don't think oh, he that's, would that's not where I was going oh no no wh where I'm going is the the the, the writers use house's pain to protect him from to protect house from criticism to allow house to make statements about the oh I see and be protected from criticism what was, was house's pain was house's internal and external and, and physical pain um, a tool to allow him to be more sarcastic to be more I mean it had that effect what's the, ch what's the chicken in the egg yeah here? it had that effect which came first I don't know Wh whether it was designed that way or whether David Shaw actually just saw a sort of Byronic um, silhouette, you know, which just appealed to him, a sort of haunted, uh, it, it's a sort of Phantom of the Opera kind of uh, thing. I'm not sure. I, I mean, he is a very clever, <laughs> I wouldn't put it past him. He, he's, he certainly, obviously, has the skill to make that work. But I don't know if that's, if, if he set out with that in mind. It just seemed to, it seemed to have that effect. It had that effect for me, and I think it did for the audience, too. Wow. So that scene, particularly, was about the problem of good and evil, right? About, about plagues happening, and she's going to keep asking me why bad things happen to good people. Um, what would House say to answer that? About, you know, when we're talking about, or I should say, what would House say? What would Hugh say uh, to the problem of good and evil? When we're talking about... Uh, <laughs> um, it, it's like it, it's one of the biggest questions that we have. It's like the biggest key. The problem of the problem of evil is the biggest thing. Why do bad things happen to good people? And when we look at this representation on television, uh, you know, everybody in the audience goes yes, and some of the everybody in this audience goes yes. <laughs> right. um, so I'm wondering. Uh, how that is, how that is viewed, how you viewed that, how you viewed the problem of, of evil, uh, is that something that, that is present in your mind as you're doing this, or is this something that just rolls off? Uh, it doesn't roll off. I mean, that's sort of almost the definition of evil is something that doesn't roll off. That's a, no, another way of putting it. No. Um, I mean, I'm surprised that it's a question that, you, that you're confronted with, because it seems to me that the religious need to address that rather more urgently than the uh, the atheists. Well, but we address it all the time. The religious just escape it; they ignore it. Right. The and, and House brought it out. You know, it, it's there is a there's an Oscar Wilde. I'm sorry to it's, it wouldn't be a complete uh, event without somebody quoting Oscar Wilde. Right. Um, <laughs> Oscar Wilde once said, um, "There is no sin except stupidity." Um, which, like all of uh, all of Wilde's epigrams, sounds on the surface silly and facetious, but underneath, I think, is immensely profound. It, it, what it says to me is that if we knew everything, if we knew the state of the universe, there would be no such thing. Um, our only failing is not knowing. Right. Um, and here's an example that I came across. Yeah, again, this may be something that's very familiar to you. I don't know. Um, it was certainly struck me. Please cut me off if I'm, this is a story you already know. The story of Charles Whitman. Does anybody know who Charles Whitman is? No. Got a lot of people. Well, I don't know whether to go on now. I don't. Um, <laughs> so Charles Whitman, uh, 1st of August, 1961. I think Charles Whitman climbed the clock tower in the University of Texas with a rifle. Yep. <laughs> And he shot uh, 14 people dead and injured another 30 or so before he himself was killed. Right. And he killed his wife and mother the night before. Now, it, it just he was like the prototype um, uh, shooter. It was just the most horrendous event. In the run-up to, the lead-up to that horrendous event, he had, um, he had kept a journal. And he also left notes at the scene, where, where, which the police discovered after they killed him, describing what he, um, overwhelming thoughts of evil and violence that he had in his mind. So overwhelming were they, and so troubling to him were they, that he actually presented himself to a number of uh, university psychiatrists who took him sort of seriously. 
I mean, they were disturbed by him. And he said, I don't know what it is. Something is wrong with me. I keep having these impulses, these t terrible feelings of violence. And in the, uh, at the scene of the crime, he had left a note asking that his body, his brain specifically, be autopsied, uh, which was done. And they found an astrocytoma, which the coroner described as the size of a pecan in his uh, amygdala. Mm -hmm. And it is, of course, unknowable whether the presence of this brain tumor was responsible for these. Um, it, 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 is, it was unknowable then and was unknowable subsequently. But by God, doesn't it make you think? Yeah. Um, what torment, what this invasion um, must have caused him and also it, it, it therefore causes one to ask the question, well, who committed the crime? What was, what is the identity of Charles Whitman that he did this thing, undeniably did this thing, is the tumor him? Is it part of him? Is it part of his essence? Uh, or is this an alien invasion? Um, it's the knowing, it's the knowing why people do things. Stories by their, by their nature are neatly trimmed around the edges. We get to know we follow the main characters and we see what their motiva motivation is for doing what they do. There are tangential characters who come in and leave and we never get to know why the pizza delivery boy you know, behaved the way he did or why he stole a purse or whatever it was. We never get to follow that strand because a story is a story and it must be, it must be hemmed, so to speak. Uh, but if we knew, if we knew everything, this is why I think that wild quotation is so profound. I think it, it would, it would make a nonsense of our the conceptions of evil, and, uh, but we don't, and we never will, probably. Well, this is a, this is a question of free will. Uh, yeah. Can you have evil and free will at the same time, and is free will actually an illusion in the first place? Uh, the, if the tumor affected his mind, did he have the free will yeah. to stop doing what he was doing? And if he did, maybe this goes back to your earlier point of believing and not believing at the same time. It, yes, I think it does, yeah. Yeah, exactly. They are... They can both be true, in a sense, but they certainly, they, they, don't, they don't allow just a sort of cozy assignation of the, of the term evil to um, a sort of glib labeling of an event or, or a person if one does not have the full, uh, if one does not have the information. Yeah. Um, God, that was a tedious answer. I'm so <laughs> sorry. Yeah. But I've, I've always been, of course, when, I, when you tell, when you describe to someone the story of Charles Whitman, it's, it sounds as if one's skipping over the awful, unimaginable pain and loss of, of the bereavement of the families uh, who, through no fault of their own, just happened to walk across the, you know, the square at the wrong time. Um, but of course, victims of accident, you know, that's, uh, that's, not the business of storytelling in a way, because that explains nothing. Um, something falling out of the sky and hitting you on the head is not a story, it's, it's, an, it's an event, it's an incident. Um, but uh, it, it is just awful to, to imagine that feeling of being overtaken by something which we could call evil, or we can call it a tumor. It's the, the our tumor's evil. Um, I, you know, they, they just becomes word His play. It obviously work. was. Well, at least it, it appears so. And, and it's, it's terrifying to yeah. think that that could happen to you. Yeah. If there, if, if there is no free will, if tumors will affect your brain like that, it's terrifying to think that that could happen to us. And so maybe we kind of pretend it's not there because we want to. But we, yeah, but we shouldn't pretend too hard. Yeah. I don't think. <laughs> I mean, and we also, neither should we pretend that we are immune from all the things that shaped us I mean, I'm not in a determinist way, but yeah, in a determinist I, you know, way. I spoke at the, at the beginning about my parents. I can't say, I can't say that if I'd been born in Syria to a devout Muslim family, I wouldn't have, I mean, it's very likely that I would, almost inevitable, in fact. Um, and, yeah, but you know. dumb luck go we. Right. Yeah. And it, and it, and it, is the word, it's not a word we use in England much, behoves or behooves? Behooves. Behooves. I think we say behoves. I don't know why. Um, but it behooves an atheist to be con constantly aware of the shaping of our own 
um, uh, thoughts and opinions, as well as the shaping of others. You know yeah. that we can't we can't imagine that we're above the fray and that we are somehow immune from these things because yeah, yeah. we're we're not. So um, I want to. He uh, didn't agree with that, though. Did I he? didn't agree. <laughs> no. Um, Here's an example. Yeah. Here's an example that I once witnessed. Yeah. Um, group of scientists. I mean, so I saw footage of it. I was not present. I saw footage of this. A group of scientists were presented with a psychic. They were all naturally, as you would expect, extremely skeptical. The, the psychic then announced that he was going to perform some feat. He was going to, I think it was a vase. He was going to lift off the table with using telekinesis or whatever. Uh -huh. And after the event, um, uh, 70% of the scientists said that the vase had not moved, but it had. They'd actually done a sort of magnet or hidden wire trick that had caused it to move. But the scientists, so convinced of their skepticism, were persuaded that, actually persuaded themselves that it had not moved. It could not have moved, therefore it didn't. So they, intelligent, disciplined skeptics as they were, even they were that was a very striking moment for me. Wow. Obviously not for you. You're, you're actually... No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Let it go. No. So, so that's the power of suggestion. That's yeah. the power of cognitive dissonance. Uh, I guess that works both ways, though, right? I mean, if somebody... Well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if somebody believes that God is in them and nothing happens, or if somebody believes in psychic powers and nothing happens, yeah. then they infer it. And that becomes an enemy of co uh, an enemy of knowledge. Right. And what you're saying is that that works in both ways. Yeah. It's, I, it's really interesting to think, because we, as atheists, we, we, we want to be a skeptical. We want to be skeptical. Skepticism is highly valued in, in, in the atheist community, in the American atheist community, and to think that we are susceptible to it is difficult for us to grasp. Of course. Yeah. 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 But, but it's. I, I don't mean it's. It's not a thing to obsess over, but it's a. The thing just to check every now and then. Yeah. And sort of think, well, I say that, that happens to be my belief, but I can't honestly say that if I'd, if I'd been in that guy's shoes, I would, perhaps I would feel the same way. I, I, you know, every now and then it's worth just taking a sort of inventory of one, one's own, not prejudices, but judices. Judices? Yeah, <laughs> I just took the pre off. Uh, I don't know if that's, uh, <laughs> it's not really a word. Let, let's head over to, because we're, we're I, I hate to say this, but we are actually close to running out of time. So I want to, um, I, I just, yeah, I know. All right, all right. We'll do two, two more quick clips. I'm going to face this way. For the, <laughs> so now both sides of the room can see how much hair I've lost since house. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's go back to a place when you had a little more hair. Uh, let's, let's do uh, clip 13. Yeah. No. <laughs> as I suspected. Now, I'm not a religious man, as you know, but henceforth, I shall nightly pray to the god that killed Cain and squashed Samson that he comes out of retirement and gets back into practice on the pair of you. <laughs> Captain Blackadder. Ah, Captain Darling. Well, you know, some of us just have friends in high places, I suppose. Yes, I can hear you perfectly. You want what? You want two volunteers for a mission into no man's land. <laughs> Code name, Operation Certain Death. <laughs> yes, yes, I think I have just the fellows. <coughs> God is very quick these days. <laughs> So, I, I, I picked that clip for the simple reason that I like the look on your face. It was, it was great. Um, can you, let's talk, a, you know, we just have a, do you have any, any, any anecdotes this year? We are actually running out of time, and I do want to get one more clip in before we go. So, um, tell me a little bit about Blackadder. Tell me a little bit about your experience there. Tell me a little bit about, uh, you're in this, you're, 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 you're in this, um, I mean, tell me, do you have an anecdote about that? Let me just leave it nice and open. Uh, we're talk um, when, I, when I see that clip, when I see that clip, I see God is going to, uh, I see a leader who is using God to support punishing somebody 
for fun. Right. And that's the original reason why I put that clip on the sheet. Right, right, right. But I really like the look on your face, so. <laughs> I actually didn't know the camera was on me. Uh, <laughs> so. No, I played an absolute uh, idiot. I played a full on, which is what I actually did for the first half of my career, was play idiots. Um, I don't know, the phone just kept ringing. Uh, <laughs> uh, it was a very, it was a wonderful experience. It really was an amazing experience. It wasn't easy. I mean, there was a lot of, there was a lot of, uh, it was intense. There was a lot of quite strong opinion flying about. You had to be, you had to go to work and be ready to fight your corner because it was, uh, you know, there was some strong willed, I mean, in a good way. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't argument, but there was it was quite an intense uh, process. But I absolutely loved it. The most, I mean, the most poignant thing about it, and in a way, maybe this is a little bit like House's uh, pain uh, uh, and the suffering, the the price he pays. Um, we had a lot of sort of research materials around as we rehearsed, and so we would constantly be. We were surrounded by these images and these stories and these accounts of life in the, in the trenches, which were so, I mean, the, the, the Pope canceled hell, but if there <laughs> is a hell, if there is a hell on earth, Northern France, 1916, would be a, that would be it. It was just unimaginable, unimaginable, the carnage, um, you know, 60,000 men yeah, in the, in, on the first day of the Somme. Um, and these were men who, by and large, were, they were raised from local regiments. So uh, that meant not, you know, three guys from every village. It was a town or a village. W it, every man between, whatever, 17 and 30 um, just disappeared. Hmm. Just, you know, the, the heart ripped out of um, whole communities and... It was, it was absolutely, it, it could, could and did bring us to tears, actually, sometimes. It's doing it to me now when I think of it, mm. um, what those young men went through for, well, my God, it's hard to argue really what, right. uh, what was gained or at least what could have been gained by other means, but it was just a horrendous uh, event. Um, and that gave it... So you'll have to forgive me if I don't. That, that's the that's the abiding memory I have of that thing. Was the 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 sense of uh, the, the poignancy of that. That we were making jokes. We were trying to do something funny, but we were doing it under this terrible, terrible black cloud of their impending death. Because you know, right from the start, you know that these guys are not going to survive. Because they didn't. People just didn't. And the day would come. The whistle would be blown. They go over the top, and that's it. They, they, if they, if they last 30 seconds, they, it, it's a miracle. Wow. Um, horrendous. Absolutely horrendous. Sorry to bring everybody down. That's okay. Um, <laughs> uh, that's a great showbiz anecdote, isn't it? Um, <laughs> sorry, I don't know that what came over me there. That's okay. Um, uh, we have uh, almost, well, we have negative time left. But I'm going to show one more clip. Okay. Uh, it's I'm not eating into your time, though, am I? No, nobody eats into my time. Okay. <laughs> well said. Well said. So this last clip is uh, very <laughs> cerebral. Uh, it's about agnosticism and children, and it's very deep, and I hope everybody in the audience can, uh, can keep up. Let's go with clip uh, nine for the last clip. Thank you. Tony Racklin is headmaster of Lanark Primary School in Thurlow. The school has 84 pupils of mixed race, religion, gender, and shoe size. Thank you, don't do that. Cheers, mate. So how does he deal with religious instruction at the school's morning assembly?
So the big question is, should that be the new uh, American Atheist theme song? <laughs> you are welcome. <laughs> we, talk about, uh, we talked about indoctrination of children and there but for dumb luck go we. Um, we, we, we. I wanted to end on a happy note, and I love that song. I, I love the children. Uh, do you have an, um, what do you think about raise, you know, when we raise atheist children here in America, um, there's this lack of group mentality, there's this lack of cohesiveness because we don't have church. And I just love that clip because it just, it, it, it's basically an agnostic theme song. Right. Um, so uh, I, I actually don't have a very good question about that. I just like it very much. Uh, <laughs> what, uh, what do you, you think? Mean a, a way of gathering people to observe the lack of observance. Uh, well, so yes, so. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and involving the children and, 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 and doing it in such a, a, a happy way. You know, it, it's, it's, difficult to, um, it's difficult to raise children when the children are being uh, subjected to other people's children who are being indoctrinated. Yeah. And what this, what this reminded me of, it reminded me of my kid who is now 21 <coughs> years old, but when they were a little one, they were a little kid, they would come home talking about Jesus because their friends did. Um, and when I saw this clip, uh, it made me kind of nostalgic for the, for the, for the raising of my child and, and, uh, and it kind of brought a little tear to my eye. I wish I had taught them, I, I wish I had taught my kid that when they were young. Um, so tell me a little bit about, um, I don't know, tell me a little bit about- Anything, just tell me about anything. <laughs> tell me about anything, you. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I, I, I see what you mean, that there is a, you want your, you would, you want your children to partake in, yeah. in, a, in the, in, you know, to belong to the body of something and not feel like they are um, excluded or skulking or, you know, that they're not part of the. Those kids were happy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's odd, it's so different. My experience is so different. I went to a very, you know, traditional um, boarding school in England, and oddly, given that it was so traditional, they actually had from, I think, 14 onwards, there was no daily religious service. There was, a, there was an assembly, but the assembly could be almost anything. It was almost like sort of 15-minute TED Talks we could have. <laughs> it, it, it really was. I mean, people could come and talk about a wonderful thing that happened, a place they'd been, a thing they'd experienced, a job they did. And religion was just, I mean, people could bring it up if, if, it, if it moved them, but it was sort of just absent. And yet we had that daily gathering, which I do think where everyone felt like they belonged, because mm -hmm. that is a very, very powerful, as, as the, relig the religious know very well, mm -hmm. it's a very powerful tool um, that, that need to belong in that we all share. Um, and particularly children, I think it's, uh, I, I know what you mean. There, it'd, be, it'd be wonderful to think that there could be some way of uh, including them, not, not necessarily it, to teach atheism, but simply not to teach religion, that's all. Well, that's, and that's what that clip was about. It was yeah, about yeah. Clip for children from all different walks and all different beliefs. We worship you, oh God, or gods. Yeah, and if you yeah. don't really exist, then ignore that we just said. Uh, it, it just seems to be, uh, it's, it's obviously a parody, but it also has some meaning to it because there, there's a statement there of diversity. There's a statement there of inclusion that I think is really lacking uh, in American society. And when I saw the kids, I mean, yes, it, it's, it's funny and it's goofy, but it also has some sort of depth to it. It has um, uh, a, a message to it of this is what it would look like if we included everybody. Right, right. Yeah, well, good. I mean, <laughs> um, <laughs> thanks for noticing. Um, <laughs> I actually had not remembered that. That's from a very, very long time ago. Yeah, well, um, we can tell from the hair. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, so, that's low. 
you. Uh, I want to uh, thank you again profusely for being with us today. Uh, uh, you have, um, <laughs> did you have a good time? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. And, and I, I will say that I also want to thank you uh, for forcing me to drink um, a martini on stage. Uh, it was, it was uh, a very nice thing. But uh, before, we, before we head out, this is the, uh, the end of this section. You're, you're off the hook almost. Um, we're going to have, you're going to be appearing at the VIP reception. Thank you very much for coming to the oh, VIP very, reception. Very um, you have anything? Where, where I'll do all my good stuff. <laughs> But I, I want to thank you for coming. Thank you for coming here uh, on your own time. Thank you for donating your time. Thank you for donating you know, your support well, to the American you. Atheist Movement. Uh, you're one of my heroes now, and you're one of my heroes before. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.